Hello, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, this is a unusual night with the experts night. We usually do it the first Thursday of each month. We're not doing that. And we have a real person in the room, which is another thing we usually don't do because we Skype people in. But it was well worth it to have a human being come and talk to us tonight. Um, you're going to be really treated, I think, to a long history of anti nuke activism, uh, success, and other kinds of uh, community involvement from a real expert who's been around the block a few times. Um, many times. <laughs> I've known Chris probably far too long. But, uh, <laughs> glad, <laughs> glad that he's with us tonight. Uh, Chris Williams uh, actually was telling us he cut his teeth on Chicago politics. Uh, and when he came here as a raw, innocent person learning the trade of activism and community involvement, so uh, and from there, it's just been one thing after another. He served 18 years as director of Citizens Action Coalition in Indiana. He then decided it would be time to retire, <laughs> which of course we know never happens to activists. So he went to New England, where he has helped close the Vermont Yankee nuclear plant. Yeah. And that was one of the reasons that we wanted to bring him here tonight, is to talk to people and get across the idea that Yes, Virginia, nuclear plants can be closed. Mm -hmm. Even in Illinois, you know, where it all began 60-some you know, years ago. So you're in for a real treat. Um, I would like you to welcome yes, yes, Chris yes. Williams. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. And uh, I got to reinforce what Dave said, that it's uh, for me, what, wait, uh, wait, 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 what time do I call you in the morning? It's wonderful to be in Chicago. I, uh, Anytime I did show up here, uh, All right. uh, in, uh, uh I'm going to need you, okay? The winter of 1979, okay. bye -bye. Bye -bye. uh, pretty much fresh out of college, um, and banged on doors for, uh, eight wonderful winter weeks in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'd studied environmental science, and a lot of it was focused on energy and, you know, the big, uh, energy crisis of the 70s and all those issues and so forth. Uh, but I didn't have a big background in, uh, in labor and just, a you know, a passing kind of understanding of some of the mechanics of politics. So there was no better place to, you know, advance my understanding of those those things than beautiful Chicago. Gave me that, you know, it's got that edge. Chicago's got that realistic edge. Chicago's got that, you know, in your face, uh, you know, this is how it is. And, and that edge, you know, has, has helped me for the last, uh, you know, nearly 35 years. I also uh, learned a lot about the labor uh, movement here and people within labor and the ups and downs and insides and outs of uh, the labor movement and how the labor movement can work with uh, other members of all different kinds of coalitions. But anyway, you know, I basically uh, started my career knocking on doors. I was a canvasser, like lots of people have been canvassers before. And uh, I was working uh, initially in New York, uh, knocking on doors, uh, working to close the Shoreham nuclear power plant, hmm. uh, which they were building on Long Island. It ultimately became the uh, uh, most short-lived, expensive nuclear power plant um, in American history. They turned it on for three weeks of low-level testing. The state of New York bought it from the Long Island Lighting Company for one dollar and turned it off. Wow. And uh, we chalked up that victory. Hmm. And uh, people in New York, which is where I grew up, used to tell me uh, stories. You know, they got these father and son unions, they call them in New York. I'm sure they have them here in Chicago, too. Uh, if your grandfather was a steel worker, then your father would be a steel worker, and you'd be a steel worker, and iron workers, and sand hogs, and so on and so forth. Well, when they were building the World Trade Center, um, and I'm sure it happens in Chicago all the time, people get up high on the iron and make mistakes, and, you know, they may fall a long way. Well, it's more than hurt themselves. You know. 
And uh, so in New York, it was common knowledge that if, if uh, you were out on the job at uh, the World Trade Center and they knew you had a problem drinking or with drugs or whatever, and for other reasons, you know, shouldn't otherwise be wandering around however many stories in the air, uh, they would reassign people to Shoreham. <laughs> they would send them out to the nuclear plant where, you know, I guess they didn't think the risk was uh, as significant. <laughs> So um, from there, as I said, they, they put me on a bus and said, go to Chicago for eight weeks. And I knocked on doors all over this city, and I knocked on doors outside of this city, and we went a couple times down closer to the state capitol and so forth, and wandered in you know, the stubble of cornfields uh, looking for homes and doors to knock on. But what we were talking about was the Bravewood nuclear power plant. And we were working to uh, uh, to try and put the the brakes on the uh, the funding scheme that uh, the Commonwealth Edison was using at the time. And I remember one day we ended up on the street outside the uh, headquarters of Commonwealth Edison. Really cool old building, someplace over in the you know, spires and marble and this and that. And uh, we were handing out, you know, propaganda, anti-nuclear propaganda, and so forth. And this guy, who is an obvious Commonwealth Edison employee, very loyal, he was in his suit. He came up and confronted my, at that time, you know, skinny, ragged, you know, activist type, you know, persona standing there on the scene. He says to me, "So why don't you like nuclear?" I said, it's too expensive, case closed, it blew his mind. He was <laughs> expecting me to, you know, to go on and on and on with him about a lecture about radiation or about this or about, I just said, it's too expensive, case closed. Uh -huh. It was so cool. I, I learned something that day. I walked away feeling so satisfied. <laughs> Going, well, that was cool. Yeah, here's this, you know, this company guy, and I just basically used the the what I believe to be the the most significant uh, truth and fact about nuclear power is that it's just too damn expensive. Always has been, always will be. And one of the reasons we're here tonight, and what we're going to be talking about later, you know, is all about their money. Whether it's Exelon's money or Entergy's money, you know, it's all about money. So from there, you know, I went back to New York, and while I was here, I met a bunch of Hoosiers. And I, I didn't know what Hoosiers were, but I met and lived and worked with a bunch of Hoosiers who were up here, um, and they were, they were getting their act together, ready to go down and open up a door-to-door -door operation in the state of Indiana, based in Indianapolis, <coughs> to address the construction of two nuclear power plants in the state of Indiana. One of them was right over here, around the bend in the lake, on the other side of the, the steel mills, called the Bailey Unit. Lots of people from Chicago were a part of what was known as the Bailey Alliance, and did a lot of direct action and worked for the NRC that uh, assisted and helped uh, to establish the fact that uh, building a nuclear power plant on shifting sand dunes on Lake Michigan <laughs> was really, really stupid. <laughs> and maybe we ought to rethink this because not only is it really stupid, but as you keep digging deeper and deeper into the sand, looking for the stability with which you have to have for your containment structure, it gets more and more and more expensive. So NIPSCO, which is now called NISource, was literally digging a hole for itself that was costing it a lot of money. And um, they got about $200 million worth of digging done, and that's really all they ever did was dig, and canceled it. And uh, the Bailey Alliance and the Citizens Action Coalition and the Save the Dunes people all declared victory. And then they went to the regulators in Indiana and said, oh, by the way, we want the 200 million we just spent digging this hole uh, back from the ratepayers. And our regulators in Indiana said, sure. And we took them to court. And the courts kept saying, those people at CAC are correct. <laughs> you can't bill people as a public utility, you can't bill people for a hole in the ground. 
the hole in the ground isn't serving the customers. We went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court, because NIPSCO kept appealing, the United States Supreme Court said, uh, you know what? It's a hole in the ground. Citizens Action Coalition is correct. We're not even going to hear this. At which time then uh, NIPSCO had to uh, give everybody their money back, which was a happy thing. I was a happy person when we got to, uh, to go and tell our members in, uh, in northern Indiana, in the region, that, uh, hey, your rates are going to go down and you're not going to have to pay for the hole in the ground and, uh, you know, there's not going to be a nuclear power plant here. Meanwhile, on the other side of the state, in Madison, Indiana, uh, on the Ohio River, not uh, just east of uh, Lowell, Lowell, <laughs> Oh, you have to say, you know, without moving your, uh, can we, do we, because I know you're filming, but I want to get to these at some point. Oh, right. Uh, anyway, uh, public service in Indiana, the largest, uh, largest utility in the state was uh, constructing a uh, two uh, unit pressurized water reactor known as Marble Hill. Um, Marble Hill ran into all kinds of problems, not the least of which was the army of door-to-door -door canisters. Very often over the years we had in excess of 150 people a day out in four cities across the state of Indiana knocking on doors, uh, working to defeat what I think everybody's familiar with, the concept of construction work in progress, which is pay it ahead of time whether or not we even do it. Uh, give us your money and we may give you something back or we may not. Very bad deal. Uh, people in Indiana got that. In the early 80s, uh, we defeated construction work in progress in four successive legislatures in Indiana. And the Indiana legislature is no easy place to go up against vested business interests, believe me. But we were able to do it and do it successfully and after the fourth time, uh, Public Service of Indiana threw the towel in and canceled uh, the Marble Hill nuclear power plant after sinking $2.7 billion of their own money into the plant. It was the largest uh, financial cancellation of a nuclear power plant in American history. And uh, here's the cool thing. Uh, these are people with MBAs, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, these are very adept business people, high powered. They had sunk more into Marble Hill and got it about 60% complete than the rest of the company was worth. And this was no small company. This is the largest investor-owned utility in the state of Indiana, mostly with a huge coal-fired power base. But they had transmission, distribution, but the, 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 they had spent more on this canceled plant than the rest of the company was worth, right? This was so well managed for 80 years, and in a short time frame of about six years, a nuclear power plant construction project managed to bankrupt the company. Beautiful. At the same time, the Citizens Action Coalition of Indiana, the largest consumer organization in the state of Indiana, went bankrupt. It was bankrupt utility versus bankrupt citizens group. It was great. You know? <laughs> And uh, we, we did all right. We got our act together. Most of the reason we went bankrupt was the uh, uh, <clears throat> massive amount of money we had to pay to, uh, to keep going to court with all these utilities over these nuclear cancellations and their attempts to charge people for them. Bankrupt utility versus bankrupt citizens group. And we won. They canceled it. And because of the Bailey decision, they weren't allowed to put the, rate, to put the money in rates. Very cool. So we made a lot of enemies in the utility industry. But they came back later and said, uh, you know, we want to make nice with you guys. We want to do what you want to do. What do you want to do? And, you know, you know, do some energy efficiency, which they did. I said to them, you know, I really want you to build some windmills. This was about uh, <laughs> this was about 1992, 93. I said, really want you to build some windmills said, if you build some windmills, I'm going to hire a brass band and have a press conference and praise your company for building windmills. And they said, well, Chris, you have to understand. 
We've done all the studies. We've looked at that sort of thing, Chris. And, uh, <coughs> there isn't enough wind in Indiana for the wind. <laughs> you have to understand. And I would sit there and say, do you ever drive to Chicago from Indianapolis on 65 and kind of stop at the rest areas north of Lafayette and look at the tattered flags that are always, <laughs> you know, flapping in the breeze? I said, I really think there's a, enough wind up there to justify some wind. Oh, no, Chris, you know, you leave that business to us. We're the professionals. The professionals that dig holes in the sand looking for stability for nuclear power plants. The professionals that spend more money building a nuclear power plant than the rest of their company is worth. And so I, you know, love the Midwest. I am, uh, I consider the Midwest one of my three or four homes. I love it here. I would have never stayed 25 years in Indiana if I wasn't having so much fun fighting incompetent investor-owned utilities and also if Chicago wasn't here. <laughs> I could have never made, I love Indy, but Indy's Indy. And I could have never made it without knowing that this place was three hours and 15 minutes away on a good ride, on a good ride. But uh, I hit 50 years old and I got roots back east. My father's family is from the state of Vermont and uh, I have family there and relatives, Welsh slate warriors. I call them sedimentarians. <laughs> anyway, uh, at 50 years old, I, I took my, my partner, Jeanette, who is a lifelong Hoosier, and, and said to her, I'm going to show you something rude. We're going to go live someplace that's very cool. We're going to go back and, you know, I'm going to live my dream. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to crawl out of the trench, the trench war. That's how I used to look at my work, what I've been doing. I'm going to crawl out of the trench. And I'm going to see what it's like to get up in the morning and not have to fight a large, you know, behemoth corporation with, you know, uh, you know, just bad politics, too much money, too much power, bad ideas. There must be, it must be interesting to maybe do something else, you know. I was going to maybe become a cabinet maker and build boxes. And, sell them to tourists. So I was going to, uh, I was going to uh, maybe get into advocacy uh, that it didn't have quite such a, a negative confrontational edge, the kind of thing I was doing for a long time. Yeah, and I'm going to do it in this beautiful place with 630,000 people. The 14th state, the Republic of Vermont. Vermont was an independent republic for 14 years. Vermont has 630,000 people, two senators, and one congressman. Vermont, Vermont has government based not on the county level, like most states do. In the end, you're going to the county jail, the courts, the county, the county collects taxes. And in Vermont, it's all based on the, the town. And there are 252 of them. It's a very, very uh, interesting place as an organizer. And I did organizing hell in this town, right? You start playing around with the numbers in Cook County, and you're looking at, you know, well, geez, how many doors are you going to have to make? You know, how many doors are you going to have to knock on? How many phone calls are you going to have to make? How many letters are you going to have to generate? How much money are you going to have to raise? In Vermont, you know, you got to go down every little nook and cranny, but when you do, it's very satisfying because people are, are genuinely open. And they're up to hearing what you have to say. So I got there and about uh, 90 days in, I'd had some connections there with some people that I met earlier uh, uh, in my career. People who were doing in New England, what I was doing out here, they were fighting nuclear power plants and actually doing a good job. And uh, I liked them all. And one of the people, her name is Deb Katz, and she's the executive director of a group called the Citizens Awareness Network, www.nukebusters.com. Mm -hmm. No, dot org, I'm sorry. And Deb said, Chris, it's so nice. You know, Deb lives in, uh, in Massachusetts, but she's from Brooklyn, so she had a very familiar 
accent for me. And she said, Chris, it's so nice to see you. You should come to a meeting. <laughs> I'm an organizer. <clears throat> I know what that means. And I went home and I said, I, I'm not sure if I should go to this meeting. It might not be a good idea to go to this meeting. I might not become a cabinet maker or a bicycle uh, transportation advocate or I don't know. I'm not sure if I should go to this. I went to the meeting. And ten years later, I'm still in a trench with, uh, with people doing what I've been doing for a long time now. And uh, what I've been doing mostly for the last ten years is uh, is working to close this quaint uh, little facility. This is from Mount Yankee. This is the Connecticut River. Uh, it's a boiling water, a GE boiling water reactor, Mark 1. You got some here. You got everything here. But this is ours, right? It's uh, 620 megawatts. It's running uh, on 120 uh, 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 megawatt um, uh, uprate. Uh, they push this one more than they've pushed any in the uh, American fleet, uh, which is very reassuring. But from an organizing standpoint, it was very nice to be able to tell lots and lots of people in Vermont just how much the owners were pushing the old machine to, uh, to make more money. And i got to say, uh, we built an, an incredible coalition, the Sierra Club. Uh, Vermont Public Interest Research Group, the Conservation Law Foundation, which is the equivalent of the Environmental Law and Policy Center of the Midwest. Uh, we had people from AARP on top of it. We had um, uh, the Connecticut River Watershed Council, the, the Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance. These are people that go back 40 years fighting this thing. We had people from Canada helping out. We had people from New Hampshire. Help um, helping out. We have people from Massachusetts because this sits just in the very southern and eastern corner of the state of Vermont where three states come together. So the, uh, the evacuation zone actually, you know, impacts people in three states. And uh, it was owned by the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Corporation for most of its uh, life. And the Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Corporation was made up of investor-owned utilities. Um, the majority of shareholders were in the state of Vermont, but there were some shareholders in Massachusetts and Connecticut as well. And in 2002, they sold the plant, rock bottom, fire sale prices, sold it off. Sold it off for 135 million bucks. Mm. The Entergy Corporation, which like your friends at Exelon, you know, had the, bri uh, the brilliant business plan that said, we're going to buy them up cheap while these companies are dumping what they perceive to be liability, you know. That's, what they, that's why these companies, that's, the investor owns, the history is, they sold off about half, more than, or close to half of the nuclear fleet in this country away from investor-owned utilities into these merchant unit fleets. Exelon's biggest, Entergy is the second largest, right? Sold these things off in a fire sale so the investor-owned utilities could get the ultimate liability they knew existed through the ownership, their ownership of these plants and dump them off into these newly formed holding companies who weren't going to be responsible, you know, in a traditional way to regulators and ratepayers, but instead were going to compete out there on the open market. Good American capitalism. And I sat in rooms and listened to these people make this pitch over and over again. I, I sat in rooms here in Chicago. I sat in rooms in Indiana. I sat in rooms in Michigan sat in conferences in Washington, D.C. and listened to these people say, we can get our act together. We're going to use economies of scale. We're going to use our collective expertise to come up with cost structures to make these nukes so competitive, they're going to wipe everybody else out and we're going to make shitloads of money. And I'm sitting there going, you really think you can? We don't think. <laughs> We can do. We can do this. 
We're going to transform the sluggish old energy markets. We're going to make everything different. So Entergy and Exelon went their way and they got all kinds of deals cut. When Entergy bought this plant in 2002, they said, you know, we really want to get our commodity price just right. We want to make ourselves competitive. So we need to cut those expenses down to the bone so we can be competitive. And one of the things we don't need anymore is we don't need ratepayers or the people who ultimately buy the power from our units to pay into decommissioning funds anymore. We're going to let the market, the magic market, right, the power of Wall Street, the power of investment, work for us to let those funds grow. So when it comes time to retire these plants, we'll have more or not more than enough money to take care of the job. What a crock. Somebody should be held responsible for what's happening right now. They have created a huge, huge shortfall in the decommissioning funds around this country. And you know where they're going to go when the time comes. You know where they're going to go. They're going to go back into the ratepayers of taxpayers because they can't go into the pockets of, uh, <clears throat> of ratepayers. So anyway, there it is. Right up in here, you know, you know the routine. This is, this is Illinois, okay? Right up there, you know, seven stories up. Uh, we have about 900 tons of high-level nuclear waste. 900 tons of uh, high-level nuclear waste. Uh, the pool was designed to hold how much, Mr. Camps? Not that much. No, not that much at all. A couple of loads, and instead, you know, they're racked and racked and re-racked and racked on top of each other. And, you know. and even in the wake of Fukushima, what does the NRC say? It's not a problem. Let's not worry about it. So uh, we're rolling along, and Entergy, when they bought the plant, said, uh, they signed an agreement that said, uh, Okay, the, the license is up on, uh, on March 21st of uh, 2012, that had been about 10 years, and uh, we will defer to the regulators in the state of Vermont, as well as the Vermont legislature, as to whether or not that license should be extended. And uh, they kind of rolled through. They were like, we're a great company, you're going to love us, you know. We're going to pay taxes to the state. Vermont's a little place. We're going to treat you well. And, and I guess for about four or five years, if you had asked the management at Entergy or you had asked the leadership of the legislature or the governor of Vermont, how's Entergy doing? They would have gone off. Oh, we're all right. We're doing good. They're trustworthy. They're good partners going to get a click. Then one day, this happened. Mm. Oh. That happened too, thank you for it. Is it advanced by itself? No. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. oh, <laughs> this happened. Cooling tower uh, collapsed. We don't have the big conical ones. We got these. Cooling tower collapsed. Uh, wow. Hang on. Hang on. It's all right. I don't know why it's coming. Cooling tower collapse, that changed the entire dynamic in the state of Vermont. Um, the company wasn't going to report the cooling tower collapse. That's a real energy lawyer right there. Uh, <laughs> what they did... Is maybe? Maybe it's on the play function? Yeah, it is. Uh, we're going to need to come out of closer. Are you using the arrow keys or the space? What they did was... Uh, Choosing the arrow What energy did was... Uh, not tell anybody about that. There we go. Uh, an employee took the picture and leaked it. And it got out around the state pretty fast. And suddenly, people like me uh, and my comrades saw an opportunity uh, to begin to ask questions and to begin to uh, put the company on the spot in a way that uh, they hadn't been before. And one of the best questions, can we go back to that or not? was, you know, and I asked this of uh, the management at a public meeting. If, if this is what's happening in terms of the way you maintain the plant, on the non-radioactive side, 
what's happening on the radioactive side, what's going on inside the containment building that we need to know about before we're addressing a situation that's probably not visible to the naked eye that could threaten the community. So what's happening there? Well, this is an industrial cooling tower. And if you go back, can you go back? It's, they're over here. And, you know, in your traditional nuclear, uh, lots of nuclear power plants, you have those, the big mm -hmm. conical, iconic mm -hmm. towers. Uh, these are just old, uh, there's a name for them. They're just straightforward industrial cooling banks. There must be a billion of them in the city of Chicago for different reasons. Uh, but they uh, are made mostly out of wood, and the wood rotted and collapsed, which is not something that you expect from <laughs> some of the most, you know, um, uh, inspected, uh, overseen, and well-maintained facilities uh, in the world, which is what anybody who works for the nuclear industry will tell you it's all about. So, uh, next, and then, so this really got the ball rolling back in 2007, and next, then this happened, that's just your run-of-the-mill, this is the reactor building right here, it's just your run-of-the-mill transformer explosion. Another, uh, um, whistleblower sent that one in. And we were using these things and many other things and really getting out there and organizing. We knocked on thousands and thousands of doors in the state of Vermont. We made thousands of phone calls. We raised money. We had demonstrations. We had concerts. We had uh, uh, teach-ins. You know, we we worked it hard, and we spent a lot of time talking with legislators. And Vermont's a small place with a lot of legislators. We have 150 members of our house, and there's 630,000 people in the state, so you do the math. It's actually not hard to get virtually every constituent <laughs> that these guys have, uh, you know, aware and, and active. And the way it works in Vermont is it does in many places. Um, you know, you go find them. You call them at home, you knock on the door, you go to church with them, whatever it is. <laughs> and the message came out, and people were just saying, we just want truth out of the company. We want to know they're not lying to us. We want to know they're honest. And so in the course of a proceeding, where they were trying to figure out how much it may ultimately cost to decommission Vermont Yankee. An intervener from a citizens group asked a question and said, are there any underground pipes carrying radioactive material on the site? This was under oath. To which the company said, no. No, there isn't. I will ask you again, you know how lawyers can be. Are there any radioactive pipes carrying material on the site? No, no, there are not. They asked again and again. They got it on the record. Next. And uh, one day we woke up to find out that there was a severe tritium leak at the plant. And the tritium leak was coming from some underground pipes that three weeks ago the company had said before our public service board over and over and over and over again didn't exist. This, no, this is an attorney. It's actually a very cool poem. And, you know, what, what he's up here to, to, to basically get across is the company stepped in a huge pile of shit. And see, in Indiana, maybe it's a couple of days on the news. In Chicago, I don't know. Flip. <laughs> what? Oh, somebody lied? Oh. <laughs> I don't mean, I, I'm saying that in the most endearing way. <laughs> I have, yeah. It's true. But in Vermont, right, in this little place, if you get up there and you raise your hand and you lie to the people and you lie under oath, uh, you can get a lot of mileage out of it. Keep 
people get very pissed. You don't get a lot of second chances in Vermont. So energy stepped in shit. And those of us who organize for, you know, well, results, let's say, uh, jumped all over this. We made it a big deal. And it wasn't long after this that uh, the legislature took up an up or down vote as to whether or not Vermont Yankees should be allowed to receive what's called a certificate of public good for <coughs> operation beyond the expiration of its original one. And uh, the Vermont Senate voted 26 to 4, no. No. It's front page news. It was a beautiful day. The people <laughs> celebrated. There are people who have been fighting this in Vermont for, for 40 years. It's a big deal. You know, Vermont was once the most consistently Republican voting state in the United States. <clears throat> it wasn't until all the, well, those people with long hair and, uh, you know, bad habits. Lots of hippies moved in and took over and basically uh, tipped the, uh, the demographics back in the mid-70s. And that's why we have such a wonderful, uh, Know, liberal paradise. But anyway, 26 to 4, we beat them. Entergy sued us. <coughs> Entergy lied in federal court. Entergy used all of the tricks in the book uh, to say that, uh, well, Vermont didn't close it for the right kind of reasons. Vermont voted to close it for the wrong reasons. They voted to close it because they were concerned about safety, and the state of Vermont has no business being concerned about safety. It is not their concern. It is the concern of the federal government. So you states, you have nothing to do with it. And you people who think that Pacific Gas and Electric is the controlling case in the Supreme Court, well, you're all wrong. We are energy, and we will crush the tiny little state of Vermont, because Vermont is a little place. Our AG's office is about the size of a, a mid-sized commercial law firm in Peoria, Illinois. And it's not what you would think of. It's just the way it is. So, on March 21st of 2012, uh, Entergy began operating the uh, reactor without a state certificate of public good. <clears throat> and what we did was turn out about 1,600 people, which in Vermont is a lot of people. And uh, we had a lot of fun. Next. Lots of fun. <laughs> That's Claire. She's one of our organizers. Next. It was a really, really long line. Went on for about a mile and a half. Ooh, quick. There's a tire warehouse, you know. And this is just here to show you that, uh, <laughs> you know, we got local businesses involved. I mean, everybody was into this. We were like, this thing's going down. The governor of the state of Indiana, completely and totally on our side, Peter Shumlin, speaking at rallies, supporting us. The governor of Indiana? The gov oh, did I say Indiana? You did. Governor of Vermont. I have a hard time sometimes. I slip. I've, I've, I've uh, mentioned uh, the capital of Indianapolis more than once in a church basement in the middle of Vermont to a whole bunch of puzzled faces when it happens. But anyway, this is just a tire place had a sign out there. What next? It was a long, long line and next. We got there to serve an eviction notice to the uh, uh, the company and we're basically saying, Entergy, you may have a federal license, but uh, here in the state of Vermont, the legislature and the people have spoken. And even though you have gotten a, you know, a stay from from the federal court saying the state can't follow through. We're the people and we're here to tell you your time's up, you're being evicted 40 years, we're glad there wasn't a bad accident, time's up. <clears throat> this is, uh, there were 140 people arrested that day. That guy right there got arrested. <laughs> he was the last one let out of the Brattleboro jail. 
There were 130 people in that jail. That was the last guy they let out of the building. Patrick Kevin King. This woman, uh, Frances, was arrested also. Uh, she didn't accompany us to the uh, to the uh, the jail. The police made uh, very special uh, arrangements for Frances. This is uh, Frances Crow, and uh, you see us sitting over here waiting to be processed. Um, these guys are state troopers. They work for the state of Vermont, which Entergy had just sued because the state of Vermont, their employer, right, insisted that this plant be closed. So the cops were great, the troopers, they're always pretty nice, and, and they were, uh, it was a hot day. It was like 80 degrees, and it was March 21st in, in Vermont. That's like mm -hmm. a really weird thing. You know, March 21st in Vermont is supposed to be gloomy, icy, and downright, you know, Cold. It's not the dead of winter, but it ain't pretty, and people in Chicago know what I'm talking about. And uh, I remember uh, Kevin and I were sitting there, and some other people were sitting there, and uh, it was hot, so the, the trooper came up and said, do you want some, some water? And I said, yeah. <laughs> we were bound by like, the wrist. And said, yeah, I'll have some water. We're drinking the water. And then he comes by a little while later, and he looks and says, would you like a cookie? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I'd like a cookie. So I'm sitting there eating a cookie and drinking water, and they, they take us to process, but they, there's Francis, right? Francis has been arrested, we, we believe, on the order of 30 times. She's 92 years old. She was asked by a reporter, so, uh, so how many times have you been arrested at Vermont Yankee? And the answer was, not enough! <laughs> she is an inspiration, and she's still at it, and she's a remarkable and, and wonderful person. And there are a lot of remarkable and wonderful people who came together over a long period of time and did everything and anything that it took to make this happen. It was, for me, after you know, 35, 40 years of doing this. One of the most remarkable campaigns I've ever been a part of. And we were getting pretty depressed that Entergy was flexing its muscles and getting away with stuff and winning and that, you know, they were ordered by the people through our legislature, by the governor, to shut down and they thumbed their noses at our democracy and said, you know what, we don't care, we don't have to care, we're energy, we're a merchant plant. We're not owned by your rate payers, we're not owned by your utility, we do what we want. The Commerce Clause says we can sell our power anywhere to anyone. Now, before that big march, I made a speech up on the, the podium in the green at Brattleboro, and I said to everybody, you know, one thing you have to understand about nuclear power plants is that the way that they close is kind of like, you know, it comes out of the blue. It's like a flash. It may not be the process we want, but they do close. And one of the things that makes them close is money. Is money and the state of their technology, which they're always in denial about. They don't like to talk about it, but I think they don't sleep well because they go home and those spreadsheets are just rolling through their heads. What was going on at Vermont Yankee, and I said this to this big crowd before we did this, on the day that that plant was supposed to close, I said, understand that Fukushima upgrades are going to cost these people 50 to 75 million bucks. They have a condenser that's leaking like a sieve. It's going to cost $150 million. Are you counting this up with me? And people are going, yeah. And then there's what I jokingly call, you know, the nuclear cost uh, escalation or, uh, you know, anything nuclear 
you get to add about 33% onto the top of it and your, your number is still credible. So anyway, I got it to about somewhere in the order of 350 million bucks that Entergy would have to cough up to keep one of the oldest GE Mark I boiling water reactors in the country alive. Meanwhile, they're getting their lunch eaten out on the open market that they advocated for. So I said to people that day, before we took that march and before many of us got arrested, I said, hey listen, one morning we're going to wake up and we're going to find out that they've pulled the plug. And they're going to pull the plug because of the math. The bean counters are going to order this thing closed and Yankee won't be the first one. As these things get older, as these things get older, the repair list goes, you know, as long as you can, uh, uh, off the charts. And Entergy and Exelon, in particular, bet on a business plan they knew would ultimately, someday, have them looking at repair costs for aging fleets of very expensive machinery that were off the charts, that were incompatible with making electricity and making a dividend for your shareholder. That's the reality of what we're looking at. So, one morning, last summer, summer of 2013, I was having a cup of coffee. It's a beautiful day in Vermont, a balmy summer day. I'm looking out at the Green Mountains and uh, TV news is on in the background. Entergy announces today that it's closing its Vermont Yankee nuclear power. <laughs> I spent the coffee out of it. What? And the word traveled fast and the word traveled long. And Entergy said, well, the reason that we're having to close it is that we can't compete with natural gas, which is maybe partly true. But one of the reasons is they were looking at a you know, $300 million repair tab to keep the thing going. They were looking you know, at all sorts of factors. They were looking at the fact that the, they tried to get long-term power contracts with utilities in the state of Vermont. And those utilities in the state of Vermont, long-term power contracts, offer more financial security, certainty, and stability than having to sell on the spot market every day gives you a little, a little bit more of a financial edge. They didn't have those, and they didn't have those in Vermont because not even the utilities in, the utilities in Vermont turned their back on Entergy, because Entergy did such a poor job establishing itself as an entity that could be, uh, could be uh, trusted in the state of Vermont and, and, and done business with. So without those long-term power contracts, and I can tell you, we helped make sure that it was unpalatable for Vermont utilities to do business with these people. That was part of our plan. So on August 27th of last year, they announced the closure. And right now, things are getting a little boring in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm, uh, I'm spending a lot of time along with my comrades, learning a whole lot about decommissioning, and I hope to... Uh, continue to ask a lot of questions uh, of people here in Chicago who are working on Zion uh, because the questions are very, very important. Uh, in Vermont we have a funding shortfall. Uh, our biggest priority is to get the fuel out of the pool because it's a, a Mark I. Uh, we want it out of the fuel, we want it in caps, and we want it done as soon as possible. The company has committed uh, to having that done by 2021. We're still figuring out how to pay for it. But uh, they're turning it off. We declare victory. So our friends in California, you know, what happened at San Onofre? 
Well, they got new steam generators, right? Happens all the time. Bad steam generators. A billion dollars worth of bad steam generators. And what they do? Turn the plant off. They're going to decommission it. People in California are happy. What it come down to? Money and machinery. Money and machinery. Complicated machines and lots of money. That's how plants get turned off. Next thing you know, we're starting to get reports that, uh, you know, the bankers are saying, you know, we're asking these companies about their spreadsheets and about their, you know, prospectus looking forward. We want to know, you know, about money. And uh, they put together a little hit list. Which plants are going down? Well, Entergy Scott Fitzpatrick, which is sitting out on Lake Ontario. What else we got? Help me out here. Who else was on that list? Half of Energy Fleet was on that list. Yeah, and there were some Exelon units on that fleet on that list too. Clinton, am I right? What else? Quad. Suddenly the uh, the word was that there were reactors uh, poised to all over the place, and Kiwani went down up in Michigan. Because they couldn't find a buyer, and Dominion, you know, figured out, you know what? <laughs> this is just a bad business plan. We're not going to make money doing this. We're not going to make money doing this. And then the one that really <laughs> blows my mind, because, you know, for all the, the rambunches head-on, you know, in the trench organizing I've had to do over the years to fight coal and, and nukes, mostly, uh, I've also taken the time, along with lots and lots of other people, to promote renewables. Okay? And look at the potential for renewables. And go back to the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act of, I think it was 1978, when Jimmy Carter said, we're going to give renewables the opportunity to, to sell into what used to be monopoly markets. And the utilities in 1978 went, yeah, sure, Jimmy. You know, we'll step on that one. We'll keep that right where it needs to go. We'll make sure that anybody that wants to try and, and make their own electricity on their roof and push it back onto our grid, that we can make it so onerous, we're just going to crush them. So it's not really a big deal. What do you hear now? Exelon, for my friends at Commonwealth Edison, as I like to remember them, right, are out here whining you know, about wind power. We can't compete with wind power. No, it just this is over subsidization. This wind power, yeah, the <laughs> wind power that doesn't have, you know, a toxic fuel stream, fuel cycle. It doesn't have it. That's why you know, when Purpa passed, everybody remember Purpa? This is not a group that Purpa was, you know. It's just another bill passed in the late 70s, right? But it gave people the opportunity, it said it right there, you know, to net meter. And some states really got into it. California got into it. Other states threw up huge barriers. Indiana was kind of in the middle of the pack, and it was mostly from just not paying attention to it. I put up a solar panel on my roof illegally and then told the company what I had done. <coughs> and. Uh, challenge them to come up with better rules or bring a bucket truck out to my house and remove it, at which time I'd have all the TV stations there <laughs> figure that one out. So there are now actually reasonable laws for it and uh, for net metering in, in lots of states and lots of people are doing it. And today I drove up here on 65 and it was a big deal for me today. This is a big day. I, drive, I talked for years and years and years about wind power. And today, as I drove up 65, I got to see all those beautiful wind turbines. And I listened to them and I didn't hear much. But what I heard as I got closer to Chicago was a whining, a whining from Exelon <laughs> that these windmills, we just can't compete with these windmills. And, these people with these solar panels on their roofs who are now getting, you know, 
so much money back that they're they're hobbling the rest of the system so that we need to to penalize these people who are grid tied because they're hurting our business and they go down to Springfield and do what they always do here and I'm not gonna I'm not in any position to comment on politics in the state of Illinois I leave that to the great people of this state right but yeah they did what Indiana eliminated energy efficiency this past session they just said yeah energy efficiency yeah take that we're just gonna take your energy efficiency program and throw it out because we can't because we're stupid <laughs> and spiteful and we can and in Ohio they threw the efficiency program out and they scaled back deployment of renewables big time and in state after state after state this happens but in Illinois I gotta tell you I thought this was gonna happen a whole lot sooner I, th I figured Exelon was going to play its card off a long time ago. Uh, but they waited. And they actually haven't even, the, the, the law hasn't been passed yet. Is that right, Dave? But, as you say here, you know, the, the fix is in. <laughs> but there's still time and you got to fight. Even if it's an uphill battle, even if you think uh, you can't fight City Hall or you can't fight, you know, the machine, you know, you got to do it. And the word has to get out there and the word has to be that, you know, Exelon ought to live with its decisions. Mr. John Rowe, I got to have lunch with him. Dave was there. Remember that, Dave? You were there, I thought. I got to have lunch, me and like 10 people got to have lunch with the CEO, the former CEO of Commonwealth Edison one day. It was great, you know, uh, this person got to talk about windmills. And John Rowe was like, oh, windmills are flying. You know, this was just after 9-11. Oh, yes, renewables are something that have, you know, great potential someday. <laughs> you know. Solar panels, somebody else talks about, yes, and someday, yes, yes. And efficiency, and someday, yes, there is, you know, some efficiency to be gained out there. Went around the table, but my job was to bring up nuclear power with it, which was the unpopular one. And I, I said to him, uh, Mr. Rowe, uh, you know, they, they said back in, uh, in New York that, uh, that the, uh, the terrorists flying the plane on 9-11 had targeted the Indian Point reactors, which are 23 miles north of uh, <coughs> Times Square. Uh, and of course, if you, uh, if you look at the, uh, the EPZ for Indian Point, there are uh, about 50 million people living 20 miles out in the circle. If you found out that, you know, terrorists were targeting the, uh, the fleet here and uh, you know, there was real imminent danger, what would you do? And he said, we'd turn them off. <laughs> That's what he said. I was right here. And then we had a very nice lunch. And uh, my point is that, uh, you know, um, these things, like Reuben, we call him back. <laughs> people have a lot to do with their closure. The actions of people, the vigilance of people, the hard work of people, the believing of people, you know. We make it happen. And I can tell you that because now I'm getting to be an old man. But this is pretty much all I know how to do. Right? I get up in the morning and it's like, what do we do now? And I want to do everything I can to help out here because this is ground zero. Mm -hmm. This is the first time you know, that they're going to come out and basically whine and say all of those things they talked about to create a deregulated electric market in 1995 and 96 and 97 it was all a lot of bullshit. And they want to go right back to the well, right back to people's pockets. And we at CAM, among other organizations, are working very hard on money issues now. 
We want to look at money issues. We want to look at um, some of the carbon initiatives that are going forward. We want to look at what the companies are doing to now, once again, try and revive and promote the nuclear renaissance, which has never happened. And one thing that's very important, and now, San Onofre, Zion, and you guys are ahead of the curve, Kiwani, Vermont Yankee, Crystal River in Florida, where they cut a hole in the containment building to change the steam generators and screwed the thing up so bad that, whoop, it, it, they would, the company would make money, more money shutting it down than, than repairing. This is the nature of this beast, this, this industry. We have, we have, you know, uh, uh, people in, in Georgia, Glenn Close and, and other people working their tails off to prevent the construction of the first new units in, the, uh, in North America in, in, what, 40 years, 40, 35 years? What's happening down there? I'll tell you what's happening down there. It's Marble Hill all over again. Every month, the Vogel Reactor cost estimates get higher and higher. And they put the burden back on the, uh, the rate payers. So we all have a lot of work to do, and there's no reason for despair here. The one thing you got to look at, what, especially what's going on here, okay? It's desperation on behalf of Ellis companies. And when you're organizing, a desperate company is the best damn thing there is. Because a desperate company makes mistakes. A desperate company makes such glaring mistakes that even a jaded media in certain places can't even ignore them. And when those things happen, the pressure builds. And when those people who make these lies and make these errors and have to look at these spreadsheets with mounting problems from exotic hardware, right, that gets a little cranky, at the same time that the bean counters are going, cut corners, cut corners, cut corners, they start losing sleep. They start doing stupid things publicly. They start doing stupid things politically, even in a place where it's, where it's very difficult if you're a large special institution to do things, you know, difficult. I, I'm trying to say, you know, even in a place that's, I'm going to say this. Make it Make it plain. Make it plain. <laughs> Just be frank. Don't, yeah. <laughs> even in a place that's that's second only to New Jersey in political corruption. <laughs> huh? Huh? Uh, you guys like that one? Yeah, you like that one? How about even? What did he say? No, I, look, I'll tell you, Jersey's got its problems, but really, this is the major leagues here. I mean, it just doesn't, you know what I'm saying? It's a title in town, and it's, well, even in a place where the nuclear generator owns the electric company, let's say that. Right. They don't find it interesting. <laughs> so, I could ramble on because I'm having a little fun doing this, but uh, I just want you to know they close, and when they close, as you know, Zion closed, right? When they close, you know, we celebrate and we get up the next morning and we work harder. And it's very important right now that we all pull together and. and, and <coughs> And keep working, and, and we also have to work against, you know, um, some of the initiatives that the uh, the companies are putting out there to tell people that that nuclear power is the uh, is the solution to global warming. And I can only uh, reiterate what our friends from the World Information Service on Energy in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands, uh, proclaim proclaim here in the state of Illinois about a decade ago at a, an action camp out on the edge of the prairie. Don't nuke the climate! Remember that? Don't nuke the climate. That was their battle cry today, and that was their battle cry then. And so, you know, the other thing you should know is that Dave and Kevin Camps 
are available to do all the heavy lifting all the time. So if there are any questions, comments, or things that need to be done immediately and on a regular basis, here they are. I also want to let you know I'm also the chairman of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service in Washington, D.C. And uh, that's an interesting trench. It's a great organization, and uh, in addition to all the other wonderful organizations that we all support, uh, don't forget NEARS, because NEARS uh, is going to be... Uh, is going to be working a lot on this renewable connection and the financial connection and putting financial pressure on them. And we need the money. So help us out at nris.org. And I'm going to stop and ask if there are any questions. Before we actually get into the questions, a little bit of housekeeping. And then I'll be the ruthless moderator of questions. I always am yeah, nice with the experts. Um, first off, uh, if you haven't signed in, some of you came a little bit later, please sign at the, uh, the table over there. We'd love to stay in touch with you as much as possible. Uh, the second thing we have over there, though, is a petition. And our goal with this petition is to get 100 of them completed and sent to Pittsburgh for the EPA hearings on the climate rules. because. The petition says very plainly, we want nuclear taken out of the EPA climate rules and, and not gobbling up the resources and money that's supposed to be dedicated to renewable energy. So if you haven't signed the petition, please sign it. And if you have, take one with you, get it filled out and return to us by the end of next week. We'll be very grateful. And there's also some literature back there that not only NEIS brought, but Kevin Camps brought from Beyond Nuclear. Uh, feel free to take some of that with you as well. Uh, one other announcement, not ours, but it's important because it ties to where Chris was a moment ago. Um, on the 30th of this month, Bill McKibben will be in Chicago, and he's uh, coming here under the auspices of CAPA, the um, Chicago Area Peace Action Organization, and they're doing a program on climate change and the EPA rules down at the uh, DePaul Art Gallery, which is on Fullerton, right next to the Red Line L tracks. So I hope you can come to that. And we will be having our banner there that says, Don't Don't Move the, the Climate. climate. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, because we do have one. <laughs> uh, so we'll be doing that. Um, all right, so here's the, the rule. Um, at night with the experts, you get a question, then we move to other people. And you don't get another question until the others have asked there. So it's kind of one at a time. Uh, we keep going round robin until we're out of time or out of questions. So, Chris, why don't you come on up here in the limelight? Right. You can be photographed better. And uh, we'll start it off. So let's just start here. Well, yeah. And say who you are. Oh, okay. I'm Margaret Aguilar. And um, Bernie Sanders is the senator from Vermont, right? He is. And so I want to know kind of how many people all together, were, you, you talked about the organizations, but in general, how many people were supporting you? And was he doing any kind of support, or he was neutral? Uh, Bernie was certainly not neutral. Bernie spoke at many rallies. Uh, Bernie, as you know, is a pretty straightforward guy, and he um, not only spoke against Yankee, saying that uh, it was too expensive and a stupid way to boil water, and renewables are much better, and on and on and on. Uh, he basically um, made his staff uh, to all of us uh, with questions, comments. Bernie is also on the committee that oversees the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and from time to time, with uh, collaboration from us, we take a jab at him to, you know, kind of get the NRC off their duffs and make things happen or not happen. And, so Bernie's very supportive. Our, we have one congressman, he's Peter Welsh. Um, he uh, has for years been opposed to Yankee and believes, as you know, most people do in Vermont, that uh, it's time to retire uh, nukes and fossil fuels. It can be done. We can move to uh, sustainable renewable energy. It can happen. It's not going to happen overnight, but we certainly have to create the environment where where it can happen. One thing we have in Vermont that's very unique is, uh, uh, it's unique to the states, is uh, a feed-in tariff. Uh, the people who build, uh, build out um, uh, renewable energy systems 
be they wind or, uh, or solar in the state of Vermont, are paid a premium on what's fed back into the grid. It's not just a parity thing mm. where, where it goes back at the rate mm. that you pay. They get paid a premium, and what that premium has done, it's called a feed-in tariff or a FIT, came out of Germany originally, um, is incentivize um, uh, building renewables. Yeah, yeah, investment in a big way. And uh, of course, there are downsides. You know, renewables aren't perfect. They have to be done well. They have to be done right, and there has to be oversight. But we're clearly um, mm. moving in a in a very new direction, and that's yeah. one of the advantages of a place like Vermont because it's so small, and uh, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of uh, a lot of people committed to getting out in front of things in Vermont. It's kind of become like a you know a part of the the, the state's personality. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to have single payer health care in two years. The first state in the union to have single payer health care. Everybody is going in the risk pool. Everybody's going in. And who's getting cut out? Insurance companies. And who's leading the charge? Bernie. Bernie likes that, as, as does our senior senator, Pat Leahy. Um, our governor, our legislature, they're, they're out in front of a lot of this stuff. We, uh, <coughs> we just banned, or not banned, we, uh, not banned. We, uh, just passed a law and required the labeling of uh, genetically modified organisms in food, which is something that's mm -hmm. become very common uh, mm -hmm. in Europe. <clears throat> and uh, as predicted, uh, within three days of the governor signing the legislation to let you know what's in your food, <laughs> uh, we're being uh, the state is being inundated by lawsuits. Okay. Monsanto, our friends from St. Louis, are on the uh, the front of the line, but the Greek the Retail Grocers Association, and this one, and that one, and it's just corporate whining. Mm -hmm. And they're whining and whining. Mm -hmm. What are they whining about? Right? Mm -hmm. Why are they suing this little state that has this, this AG's office that's the size of a, you know? It's all about their money. It's all about their fear. It's all about their not wanting to be truthful. And uh, it's more than she asked, but she said Bernie. <laughs> she said the magic word. Um, <laughs> Poll after poll after poll after poll, and they're easy to easier to do in a place like Vermont. Eighty percent of the people in the state of Vermont said, "Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I'd like to know uh, what's in my food." So keep an eye on that one. Yeah. Does that or, mean? Okay, just a quick question on the GMO. Uh, on this, all right, real yeah. quick. Um, mm -hmm. Does that mean that like craft foods, if they sell to Vermont, they have to create special packaging just for Vermont? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's one of the things they're whining about. But you know what? Uh, if you pick up a, um, a soda can, uh, you'll see specific labeling for different states that have mm -hmm. different bottle return laws. Or you know, some states mm -hmm. will will let you. You know, we have a we have what they call a, we have we pass a bottle bill in Vermont, 1973, which basically said anything carbonated in the state of Vermont, you know, you got to pay a nickel, mm -hmm. right? And that leads to people picking up cans on the side of the road and Cub Scouts, you know, financing themselves by keeping the state clean and whatever. But for the longest time, there are different standards. So yes, they may have to print some different uh, labels. And that's part of, you know, the other thing is there are, there are states now getting in line. Vermont is doing it and crossed over the line. Uh, Oregon, uh, Maine, Connecticut have passed laws, but they put triggers in that said, well, we passed this law, but three states have to go ahead of us before uh, we're, we're back here on the line. <laughs> so Vermont basically has now, I believe, when what we've done is going to trigger a whole lot of other states um, to step up and do the same thing. So, a question or, back? Yes. So Louder. We are in Illinois and a um, certain sense of where we are in this activism process. So, do you have any specific suggestions for us at this point, Chris, about what particular <coughs> actions or how we should go about this, taking on this $20 billion well, company and the rest? I, you know, <coughs> I threw some of them out as I was going along, and I mean, all, a lot of them are the, the usuals, but. Uh, as I said over in Michigan uh, back in January, and what I say a lot, um, 
you got to keep doing what you're doing, but the, the, the environment that we live in now really, really demands that we keep an eye on their money in a way like we've never done before. That's right. And we look mm -hmm. for any pressure point we can with regard to their money and amplify that through the media. And by that I mean, if we find out that, that there are all kinds of pending pieces of repair work, upgrades, and all kinds of things coming due, you know, do your homework, do your accounting, put that bill together, and then start a drumbeat out in the press going, where's that money going to come from? Mm -hmm. And if they have this much money, you know, having to go out, is that going to mm -hmm. is that going to cause them to start cutting corners in crucial places? Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of things to look at and begin to dog them with. Mm -hmm. And again, I leave a lot of this because I'm out here as much to sit up here and talk as I am to learn about what's going on. Because believe me, there, there many of us all around the country are watching what's going on here now mm -hmm. because this is where it's happening. Exelon is stepping up. Exelon is stepping up and saying, you know what we said 15 years ago? Forget about that. We're going to change the rules. And we're going to whine about it. And they're also going to use the hammer of ALEC, as I call it. <laughs> Other people call it ALEC. I like to call it ALEC. The American Legislative Exchange Council. They're out there trashing renewables left and right to destroy what little opening we got from PURPA back in the 70s because it scares the hell out of them because we're winning because it's a revolution right yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. but is it about renewables no it's about coal and nukes is what it's about and 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 as much as you know you can be pessimistic or whatever I'm optimistic these people are going to step in it, and we have to help. And I don't know if that, you know, necessarily answers your question, but that's the first place to look. And I want you to know that we want to know what's going on. We want to, you know, people around the country. We need to, we need to come together as a movement more than we have uh, in in a while, and combat this thing. And we need to maybe reach out to a whole lot of other people, like the renewable energy people. They have to understand that. They've been out there surfing this wave of, wow, you know, everything we said was true. The cost of solar panels is plummeting. There are windmills in the state of Indiana. What the? Windmills in the state of Indiana, right? There's incredible energy efficiency going on. Biofuels development, this, that, all sorts of stuff. Those people have to be pulled into our camp. Very important work. You got to get a hold of the renewable people and tell them this is their fight too. Because the plan with coal and nukes is to destroy the momentum in the industry that's, that's, that's out there and being built. That's, right. that's natural allegiance. And I just wanted to add to that. Um, last month, the director of NEARS uh, came out here, Tim Judson. Yep. And he and I, Kevin Camps, John LaForge from Wisconsin's uh -huh. Nuke Watch went to the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair doing exactly what Chris was talking about. Got to going table by table to the renewable vendors mm -hmm. and saying, look, mm -hmm. your bacon's in the fire now, folks. You know, if these guys win, you're out of a job. Yep. And we intend to do that in August at the Illinois Renewable Energy Fair, the weekend of August 22nd, 23rd in Oregon, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Come on out, folks. Mm -hmm. so, question. Uh, speaking you know, both as a uh, activist and as a scientist, I mean, constantly bombarding the people who are talking about the thorium's and the uh, salvation of uh, uh, nuclear fission plants. Yes. And I, I'm not that quite uh, an expert on it, but I think uh, this to me sounds like fantasy. I think there are certain issues with thorium usage that are just as serious as with the... Right. Uh, it's just the another form of solution. So what, what is a good... Uh, I, I want you to know. Elevator speech to give to these people. I, I want you to know that. Um, for sorry usage. I can't even do that. And the reason is that every time somebody gets me worked up on thorium, I go to some of my best resources, which are 
the Nuclear Information Resource Service, the Nuclear Energy Information Service, Beyond Nuclear, and people that I know and respect uh, point me to, um, to pretty short, straightforward articles that point out the fallacies of uh, the statements made by people promoting thorium and also the, as you say, uh, uh, the downsides that they never talk about. And consequently, I kind of absorb uh, three or four pages of thorium stuff and then move on to uh, the reality of, of, of fission reactors in our daily lives. So, what I would recommend is that uh, you ask Corey, who <laughs> undoubtedly has uh, just an unlimited amount of information about Thorium. Corey? He's shaking his head. No, Kevin? No free lunch. He pushes oh. some mean buttons, too. I had the pleasure of debating a pro Thorium guy a couple years ago in Michigan, so I had to do a crash course. And, and uh, I turned to Gordon Edwards' work and uh, Arjun Makajani. One of the big ones mm -hmm. for me that blew my mind was during the Manhattan Project, Thorium was considered as a pathway to the bomb. Yep. And it was uh, it was thorium two thirty two converted to uranium two thirty three, so it turns out that it, it, uh, mm -hmm. it was an atom bomb that they were considering in the Manhattan Project. So it, it turns out that thorium has really serious proliferation risks. So if we spread thorium mm -hmm. around the world, if we spread uranium further around the world, we're just inviting weapons proliferation. You know, we're dealing with that in Iran as we speak. So weapons proliferation, radioactive waste problems, the cost alone, um, <clears throat> the thorium industry, what they want, and they've got traction on the Hill incredibly, is to get access to the U.S. Treasury because they've got hundreds of billions of dollars of development in mind that they would make the money on because they have to create themselves all these reactors that don't exist. So it's just kind of a, a replay of the uranium nightmare with a different element. And I think oh. if, uh, Arjun, actual, Arjun Makajani, uh, Actually, I did read a, it was a 10-pager, I think, that he did. This was quite a few years ago. In but the I, board. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very good resource that you could read and distill uh, an elevator speech out of. But, and the uh, Sierra Club has a fact sheet on Yeah. Nuclear Kent has a fact sheet on They took from Makajani's. Yeah, so fortunately, I, I'm, what I'm just saying is I don't spend a lot of time with it as much as... Uh, uh, lately, uh, you hear it from time to time, but it's like the modulars, which I think is probably a more immediate threat than thorium. Uh, but even it's a long shot. The modular reactors, the mm -hmm. small modular mm -hmm. reactors, the the mm -hmm. kind of reactor that Ron Popeil himself would develop if he could. Ron Popeil of the uh, Popeil Wemo. Uh, mm -hmm. The pocket fisherman. Pocket fisherman. <laughs> And uh, the, the rotisserie that allows you to, and this is why I make the connection, set it and forget it, right? It, that is going to be very interesting to see where it goes. And, you know, I'll say it here in Cook County, because i got to say it while I'm in Cook County. Um, it, it was never a surprise to me, and I've been telling this to people now, true believers for many years. Um, I think it was a wonderful thing in the United States, for the United States, that, uh, that Barack Obama was elected president. And I think it was a wonderful thing that he was re-elected president. And I say that knowing full well right, that to become president of the United States ultimately beginning as a state senator from Cook County, Illinois, and moving on as a senator from the great state of Illinois, uh, there's a price to be paid to the folks uh, who run the electric company here in town for any politician from this state that ever gets that far. And I didn't think it was going to take uh, six years for him to really have to push the buttons, but that's what he's doing. And I, I got to actually one day sit in a meeting with David Axelrod before he, oh. um, before he won the campaign. And uh, Mr. Axelrod was a, uh, an advocate for none other than the Exelon Corporation. Mm. 
So it's, none of it's a surprise is what I'm saying. And I think the president has tried to be as restrained as possible. But in the end, there's uh, he has to do what he has to do. That's the way it works, right? Next. Dave, can we get let, let back and I have to go feed the meter? Sure. Yeah, just push the button. Because no, yeah. they, I assume they take it. Right. They they the Lincoln Park Pirates. Right? Yeah, I, uh, They're still okay. Question, who are you? Uh, Gail Snyder, NEIS. Um, we have 11 reactors here that are operating. Yeah. And we don't have a particular shut down any one of them campaigns. Right. And it sounds like you've worked pretty much on shut down specific nuclear reactors. So I just wonder sometimes if maybe that is, um, it's kind of hard for the general public, I think, to wrap their mind around some of this stuff. And if we picked a particular reactor, um, maybe a GE Mark I or two. GE um, Mark ones are, are, uh, are, are, are nice and wobbly. I like, uh, yeah, you know, or a real old one, whatever, whichever one, and decided we were going to launch a campaign. Do you think that that would be um, kind of a general anti-nuclear and now right. Exelon, you know, oh, bad Exelon. But I don't know that that's enough for people to really rally behind. So I'm wondering if we should well, launch I, a I, particular I campaign. I think it, it's a different, you know, both of those things are very important things to do in my estimation. And I think that um, uh, targeting a reactor and attacking it locally, and by locally I mean, you know, let's take Clinton for example, sure. right? There's a nice <laughs> wobbly old reactor that's been, you know, on and off watch lists and in trouble and this and that for a long time. Yeah. You know, go and find out, you know, how many people around, you know. The, the thing I always learned about organizing, uh, you know, is, is if you want to know what's on people's minds, you go out and you ask them. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, but the best way that I know of is to knock on doors. And if you do it enough, uh, you're going to knock on some employee's door. And that employee is going to take it back to the company on Monday morning and go, those people were out knocking yeah. on doors and they were handing out this literature. And then you wait and see, you know, just how stupid the company is going to get. And, just, and, and that's just one way to do it, but that's just, you know, make them miserable. That's what Deb Cat says <laughs> all the time. And i got to say, I, I enjoy uh, our, our staff meetings where, she closes after we come up with a plan. She'll just say, make them miserable. <laughs> and, uh, and she's absolutely right. I found that, yeah, misery is uh, Some people like to play too much by the book sometimes. And I don't know if that goes on out here. I know some people back east that like to play it very much by the book and never offend anybody and never this. And that ain't my, that, that's, that doesn't, I, I, I really want, uh, not the safety people. I, I want them to get a good night's sleep, but I want the upper echelon management, you know, to go home and have a hard time sleeping, or you know, go home and have to drink too much. Or I really, I, I make no bones about it that I, I want their uh, uh, their lives to be miserable from the lies that they tell, and you know, I want them to make the right decision. And if uh, paranoia and fatigue and lack of sleep or too much drinking is how you get it done, then that's how you get it done. But seeking the truth and putting it in their face as much as you possibly can. Yeah. And I, you know, when it comes to nuclear power plants, I ain't polite about it. You, you know. Is there a question here? Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, um, in Illinois, right. we have this high unemployment rate. Yeah. And uh, so I'm wondering um, if you, when you were working on Yankee, if you ran into locals saying, don't touch it, that's where we make our money, and uh, we, we, we got to put up with it, and how did you handle that? We absolutely did, and it is in some ways a vexing issue because it is their livelihood. Um, I go at, I, I don't, I, I make it a point, not I don't go at the people working line. I point my finger at the, mm -hmm. the executives and so forth. But those questions were raised all the time, and many of our responses were, 
we want to make sure now, and this was before they made the announcement, that we do planning for transition for the workers. Right. We said that we want the workers retained and we want them on the staff, not only for their well-being and their ability you know, to continue to earn their living and so forth, but also because they know where the bodies are buried. They know mm -hmm. where the worst spills are. They're the people that have to be around as you go through mm -hmm. um, the phases of decommissioning to take care of business. They're the ones that know where the bo bodies are buried. And that expression in Vermont may be more of a liberal <coughs> thing here in the <laughs> <laughs> county. I, I really don't know. I, but we, we went out of our here. way. We also reached out to the unions. And as, as we all know, um, you can never uh, paint labor with a single brush or a single stroke. And so some of the union people were right there with us and were understanding and were forward looking. And others were hostile and most of the hostility came from the actual uh, bargaining units within the, within the gates. But we always made it a point to say that the workers were important to us, the most notice that they could get uh, uh, the most benefits and retraining that they could get uh, and not allowing, and I suspect this is a problem in Zion, I got uh, no one said it, but I'll bet, um, you know, we made it a point, and we don't know if this is going to happen yet in Vermont, to insist that they don't do one of these bullshit deals where they lay everybody off and then hire a trickle of them back at half their, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Half their pay without benefits. You know, you want to make the case and you want to get a politician beating the drum with you to say, you know, we've got to keep them at union scale and, and so forth, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, the bottom line is, is that it means job loss in that part of the industry. And I don't ever, you know, uh, apologize necessarily for that. Um, and, and there are people in the local reactor community itself um, who are, they're, they're not, the people in Vernon, Vermont, <laughs> right, um, are in their own, they're, they're in a very separate place by their own construction, I mean. Um, but if, if you go one town over or one town up, the vast majority of people are opposed and want to close because they see it as a threat to their community and their children. And it, you're never going to convince the people that work there anything other than, you know, it's clean and green and it's too cheap to meter and, yeah. Yeah, but that's one of the things that makes it so dangerous that the people who work in the industry, in order to keep going on with it, they have to lie to themselves. They have to go around saying and thinking and believing that it's safe. And that's, it, it would be a lot safer if they actually acknowledged the danger. Well, and I mean, one of the things, one of the wonderful things that, that you know, we have from time to time and that we have to look for from time to time that is so incredibly helpful. And it doesn't happen because you want it to. It just seems to happen because of what you're saying. That somebody within the ranks stands up and tells the truth. And uh, one of the people uh, that I've gotten to know and uh, gotten to work with for the last 10 years uh, in Vermont, and I didn't know him before that, is Arnie Gunderson. Mm -hmm. Arnie Gunderson uh, lives in, uh, in Burlington, Vermont with his wife Maggie, and Arnie Gunderson was a vice president of a, a nuclear company. And Arnie Gunderson was, uh, was and is a nuclear engineer. And Arnie Gunderson blew a whistle. And Arnie Gunderson got blackballed. Mm -hmm. And Arnie Gunderson got shit on and kicked out of the industry that he had committed his life to. And Arnie Gunderson works with us now. Arnie Gunderson stands shoulder to shoulder with us to tell the truth. And I can assure you, Arnie Gunderson sleeps very well. He gets a good night's sleep. He's been through hell. They sued him. They destroyed his personal finances. All right? Come on upstairs. 
They threaten the well-being of his children and their future with regard to college and all the rest of it. And now Arnie's a champion. And now Arnie spent a lot of time in Fukushima. And they call him, his name is Arnie Gunderson. But in Japan they call him Gunderson Song. <laughs> and they love the guy. And it's important that you, that you reach out to those people and find them. It's also important to know that, like in a place like Illinois, boatloads of people, boatloads of people have worked for the, the industry in one capacity or another, and they've shuffled in and out. And, and one thing I know about people after they leave a job, they're in a different place, in a different position, and they'll talk about things that they wouldn't have talked about otherwise. And so seeking those people out and Finding out what they know is very important. You can't believe how many lobbyists I've gone up against over the years, on not just on nukes, but on lots of different energy and issues and so forth. And, you know, uh, this is in Indiana. And uh, these are people who work the lobbies, work the halls. These are people who get up in the morning and straighten the tie and say, let's get out there and lie. And these are the people that work for Monsanto. These are the GMO people. These are the nuclear people. These are the coal people who get up and go, it's clean as a whistle. It's coal and it's clean as a whistle. And they're off to work, right? And, uh, and then you do battle with them, right? And sometimes they win and you lose. And sometimes you win and they lose. And bam, 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 right? And you, you duke it out with them. And it happens on a regular cycle all around this country once a year. And then some of them retire. And I love running into those retirees that I used to do battle with, ideological battle with on these issues. And I run into them in a bar, and they don't have the suit and tie on. They get a nice sports jacket on, and they're looking so relaxed, right? Chris, how the hell are you? Hey, it's good to see you, Tom. How are you? Hey, Chris, this has happened to me more than once. Hey, Chris, I gotta tell you guys, you were right. <laughs> you were right. I can't tell you, that's, that's probably happened to me a half a dozen times. Mm. I run into retired lobbyists that I did mm. extreme total battle with, mm. and because the pressure's mm. off, mm. and they get to get mm. up and tell the truth, mm. and they've had a little drink, mm. yeah, you guys were right. Oh, and those people you have going door to door, that was great! You know, I was like, okay. <laughs> Let me check, is there someone who has not asked the question or made a comment? Let's see. Oh, are. Oh, oh, I'm Kathleen Rood, and um, what's been really inspiring for me and, and is to, again, be reminded that these things take a long time. Yeah, they do. They take a really long time, and and with a lot of different people. So my question is, there she, um, is. There she is. <laughs> and so people like her and like you and all the people that you that volunteered over the time, what keeps you going and what keeps them going when, when it's the bad times and you think, damn, I can't do this anymore. Wow. You know, where do you find your source of let's keep going and how and, and to inspire others to say, we, not, we have to keep doing this. I've used, been using a, an analogy uh, for my job mm -hmm. or jobs over the years. It's all the same to me. But, uh, and I, I, I liken it to a trench war. You know, I'm in a trench. I'm not always in the best conditions. And we spend a lot of time, sometimes a lot of time, uh, squabbling over 150 yards, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You get out, you raid over the top, and then you drag the bodies back, in, and you're fighting a, a trench war. And so for me, uh, I know personally, uh, you can only get so serious. This is all serious stuff, and, and you know, and as I learned early on here at the Midwest Academy and other places, and organizer training, uh, my, my, our biggest weapon is our credibility. So we always have mm. to know what the hell we're mm -hmm. talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I also um, 
like to always put uh, a humorous edge into at least uh, every hour of my day in one way or another. Sometimes I've been accused of, you know, taking it a little too far sometimes, but generally, you know, you don't let that, don't let it drag you down, you know, and, and, and most importantly, and this is what it's about, this is how it happens. You know, we, we gather the strength we need to go forward in these fights from one another, period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You look to your comrades, and even though some of us are a thousand miles apart, I know, you know, that guy right there, that mm -hmm. one, is probably working too hard and should take a break, get out and laugh a little. But I know every day when I get up to do what I'm doing, that he's doing it, and if I pick the phone up and said, what are you doing, Kevin, you know, I'd find out that, you know, he was in fact doing it. This one too. And on and on and on. But the, the it comes from the, yeah. from solidarity. It comes yeah. from that concept. This is the, from what I learned about labor the, the, all those decades ago here in, uh, in Chicago, that our struggle is, you know, is one. That mm -hmm. that's how it happens. And so when somebody gets bummed out or somebody gets too damn serious, right, uh, you got to be there for them. And when somebody just keeps cracking jokes, somebody's got to look at them and say, hey, man, this is serious stuff. Why don't you take a break with the jokes, right? <laughs> so I don't know if that helped, but it really, that, you know, in my experience, um, I have worked with and stood by uh, through very, very long, difficult uh, campaigns, mm -hmm. incredible people. And we used to have uh, lots of tricks too. I, one thing that doesn't happen enough, and I wish it did within the anti-nuclear movement, is that there were more uh, national confabs where mm -hmm. uh, where bunches of us were pulled together for, uh, you know, we used to do the action camps. But Dave has done some great uh, work to, you guys have done some good uh, conferences and so forth, but it's important to pull everybody together. But mm -hmm. I remember once we had a conference uh, Citizen Action Organizations did, and uh, and I was doing the logistics. I was in charge of you know, all kinds of stuff. But one of the things I had to do was find speakers, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I reached out to to um, people who worked with Cesar Chavez, and Cesar came and spoke to us, right? And then Cesar came out and hung out with us afterwards. And then the next morning, you know, Cesar said. Uh, if you do this again, you have to call me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we did, again and again. And, and after a while, you know, we probably had him out, I don't know, four, five, six times, uh, drinking beer with Cesar Chavez, right? And he's going, he said the stuff. I mean, and it's all written. I mean, he's the one, he's the authority on, you know, when times are tough, how do you keep going? Mm -hmm. And he had more answers than I have, but I remember standing on a lawn in Indianapolis with Cesar Chavez. Maybe the third or fourth time I had hung out with him a little bit. We laughed and he finished a Budweiser and crushed the beer can on his head. <laughs> and I laughed my ass off and I said, Cesar Chavez just crushed a Bud can on his head. How cool is that? And the next morning I got up and I went to work and I mean, he just, you know, if people are having a real hard time getting up and doing this, uh, you got to reach out. And and honestly, there are some personalities that can't handle it, and they'd rather move on and do something else. And you know, if that's if that's what they want to do, that's okay. But uh, got to work like hell to find the people that want to do this and hang in there together and support one another and not give up. And and most importantly, you know, you got to see progress. I learned that at the Alinsky-inspired Midwest Academy, where Mr. Williams got his left-leaning perspectives. This is what the uh, Indianapolis Star used to write about, right? <laughs> but Mr. Alinsky taught us that you get the little victory, mm -hmm. and then another little one, and another little one, and another little one. So everything counts. Every damn bit of it counts. You know, if I get up in the morning and I have a piece of information and I figure out a way to get a reporter to weave it into a story or ask a, a question that pisses off an executive, I win and I go to bed and have a good night's sleep and wake up the next morning and find another one of those tidbits. Mm -hmm. 
And then some days, you know, you have virtual concussion bombs to work with that make your life uh, great. But I hope that helps. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Someone who has not asked. I have right. We'll end with you, and then there'll be some announcements. Uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. If you Thanks for listening. Help us uh, clean up at the end, too. So, Leanne, you get the last word. Well, it will be a word. It's not a question more than any. It's an awareness of what's really happening in our lives on a national level. We are fighting the nuclear issue. We're fighting the genetically engineered issue. We're fighting even 2,4-D going into genetically modified corn, Correct. which is... I consider slow murder. Yep. I know about that yep. a great deal. Uh, we're fighting the whole issue of the climate change. So I am wondering, with all those issues, and I haven't even begun to list them all, there has to be an awareness that something larger than just each one of these issues is happening, and it really is the corporate power in the corporate state. Absolutely. And what we need to do is find alliances with other people who are involved with an issue here, an issue there, and then coalesce around that power. I couldn't agree more. Okay. That's really all I, I have I couldn't to agree say. more, and I have to say that, you know, I believe I could be wrong, but I believe that we're at a point now where you're going to see more and more momentum. I hope you're right. Moving, no, I, moving in that direction. Uh, I think uh, the slap in the face that is Citizens United, yeah. the other things, offensive things that the Supreme Court has been doing, mm -hmm. um, it, it, because of the gerrymandering. <laughs> It may not uh, result in the kind of movement we would all like to see um, in the House or even the Senate, for that matter. Um, but I think you're slowly going to see some of the uh, some of this stuff bubbling up in a way um, that the people uh, running those agendas didn't necessarily intend when they started. From your mouth. <laughs> That's what I said. And I really believe, you know, if if. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you know, I believe there are uh, a lot of women out there that are very, 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 very pissed off. Good. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's going to be a demographic uh, that can be um, uh, measured and is going to show up significantly uh, in the midterms. Mm -hmm. I believe it. Thank you. Especially after this last, uh, these last several rounds of this, you know. And what time is it? i got to get to the Hobby Lobby. I want to thank you for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to coming back. You're welcome to come back. A couple of quick announcements, and then you're welcome to stick around. Mm -hmm. uh, like with any great establishment, tip the wait staff. <laughs> who are the wait staff, you wonder? Well, we really don't have any, but Mike Callis is close enough. He, he is the one who runs Multiculti along with several other friends here. Got us the space. Multiculti needs money to stay in existence. There's a donation bucket if you're so inclined. And so does NEIS, so there's a bucket back there as well. Uh, second announcement is, if anyone knows of any shareholders of Exelon, yeah. please put them in touch with me in the next two weeks. That's all I'm going to say, but please let's talk about that. And we hope to see you at the end of the month at the Kappa event, uh, which will be taking place at uh, the DePaul Art Center. So thank you for coming tonight with the experts. You can stick around for a little bit. If you see any popcorn on the floor, please pick it up and throw it away. And have a good evening. Thanks mm -hmm. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.